uh, Baker Scholar from Harvard Business School, and the co-founder of companies having won several SBIR awards. And he can show you how the business mindset can work with government resources in a startup. So Joss Mohol was CTO and co-founder of Zephyrus Biosciences. This is a company that was devoted to developing single cell analysis instrumentation. It was funded by SBR grants and very recently acquired. So right from the start, SBR to quick acquisition. So now we'll move into the main presentation with Gabriel. Uh, so Gabriel LeBlanc, clients have included university, biotechnology industry, NIH institutes, nonprofit medical foundations. Uh, she has a BA in biology from Harvard, a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University School of Medicine. She spent her early career as an assistant professor at Oregon Health Sciences University, studying neural development and avian embryos, and moved to the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where she served for 11 years as a program director in neurogenetics and neurodevelopment. At NIH, she administered multi-million dollar portfolios of research grants and contracts in basic and clinical neuroscience, and led funding initiatives in neurogenomics, neural development, and neurogenerative disease. Dr. LeBlanc left NIH in 2007 as a free, uh, freelance consultant here in Berkeley. So you can talk to her about consulting for SBR grants right away. So I'd like a nice warm welcome for Gabriel to come on up. Must pay X amount 
amount of dollars from the budget to FBI or grants. So when I was at NIAGS, for example, sometimes the institute would have to reach quite low. They might only be paying their regular research R01 grants to the 10th percentile, but to spend their SBI or SDT R money, they might be reaching to the 30th or the 35th percentile for SBI and SBTRs. The situation isn't nearly as rosy as that now. I'll show you some figures, but still, um, still it makes the, your chances better than with an R01 typically. <coughs> So here are some figures about great companies that have been funded by SBIRs. Um, uh, for some companies, particularly in their startup years, SBIRs may be their major source of funding. And some of our people here all know about the TV and Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so TV3 companies have had success with it. And one nice thing about getting SBIR money in addition to the money is the fact that since it comes from a government ed, um, agency, it gives you, and it's been peer reviewed by fellow scientists, having a grant like that gives you a certain credibility among scientists and potentially among other investors that um, you might lack without a government grant. So the, the program, the kinds of grants are, phase one is to fund the earliest um, stages of your project, feasibility, design, early testing. Um, these are not big grants, funding is typically for six months. NIH is very sort of uh, dodgy about what the real cap on these awards is. Technically it's supposed to be 225, but in fact, um, even in the program announcement, they waffle. So you should always talk to your program officer to find out if you can ask for more money than that. Um, but don't ask for it without talking to your program director because you, your grant might just get booted out just for that reason. Um, so if you succeed with phase one, then phase two is where more of a payday comes. Now you're eligible for two years and $1.5 million. Um, and the success rates for phase two awards are considerably higher than for phase one awards. So if you make it through the, getting the phase one and doing reasonably well with the phase one, your phase two chances are pretty good. Phase three is not, um, oh right, and so phase two involves uh, further refinement of your product, road testing to make sure that it's scalable for commercialization things like that, um, clinical or early clinical studies. Then phase three, the commercialization process. No government funds are currently available for this, but as we just got that email saying, there's actually a motion up in Congress now to try to get government to um, also fund phase three awards. Here are the participating agencies, all others we'll see in a minute. These guys, I assume you're, you'll know what the acronyms are. DOD is by far the biggest funder, um, although not, I don't believe, with biological research. For biological research, it would be NIH followed by, I suspect, NSF. So that's how the pie breaks up. And then here by agency, not everybody but they all do SPIRs, but not all of them do STTRs, and so you can see up here which are the ones that do STTRs. And then um, these can be funded by either a grant or contract mechanism. The difference between these two things, as you may know, is that uh, if it's a grant, then the topic is picked by you, the, the grant applicant, and you don't once you get the money, you don't really have to do exactly what you said you're going to do. There's some, you know, freedom for, it'll, you know, poetic scientific license. Although if you get too far off your original aims, you may not get that grant renewed. Um, but nobody's going to come and try to take the money away if you don't do what you said you were going to do. Contracts, on the other hand, the topic is usually picked by the government, and in that case, you do this very specific statement of work which you have to do pretty much exactly what you said and they said you should do. And I'll be talking, I'm going to leave contracts there, I'll be talking about grants for the rest of the yes. 
So these are the eligibility criteria. Um, they've loosened up in recent years. Uh, it used to be that I think that there could be only one outside funder, um, maybe none. But now you can have outside, uh, outside funders as long as none of them owns more than 50% of the company. And then in terms of your commitment, uh, you only have to be committed. You don't, have, you don't have to quit your day job to apply for an SBI or SBR. Um, you only have to quit or give up as much time as you said you would if the grant actually gets funded. So all of this, um, more details about eligibility, et cetera, on the NIH um, website. So the main difference between the two, uh, I always forget this myself. So the, the basic difference is STTR stands for Small Business Technology Transfer. The basic idea of it is that you're moving some science out of the university lab into a business. Um, so ergo, in the STTR case, the university must get at least 30 percent of the total award, and the PI is usually um, at the university. Now, the downside of the STTR is that oh, and by the way, with the STTR, you still um, you can't be doing this out of your lab at a university. You have to have independent outside place that is your your place of business. <coughs> And then also with uh, university IP issues are more complicated, don't ask me about them. Um, I am not a lawyer, but I'm sure these people will know more about that. Um, so SBIRs are sort of more generally independent, uh, and subcontractor, subcontracts to all outside places, including a university. So you still can partner with the university, you don't have to, but you can't. But total outside contracts are less than a third, usually up to your own. I have a sense that the STTRs might also be more competitive in the STRs. So if you look at the budget, it's just so much, it's 90% of the Yeah, I have the, I actually have the actual figures on that at the end, so if you remind me, at the end I have the table for that. Do you actually have to be incorporated to, to apply to an SBIR? Do you have to have articles of incorporation for the purposes of getting a um, tax ID number. Okay. The only reason you need to get that is so that you can register with the, with the, there's a bunch of irritating complicated registrations, five different registrations you have to do right. for, and it's only for that reason to get the TIM that you have to um, do the articles of incorporation. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to tell you about navigating the NIH system, which is a particularly Byzantine one. So as you may know, the NIH consists of 26 institutes and centers, also referred to as ICs. NIH likes nothing better than acronyms. And then the funny one, which is CSR, which is the Center for Scientific Review, which is uh, the entity that does virtually all, runs virtually all of the peer review for the NIH institutes. Now, people frequently find this organization confusing. Also, just the different uh, institutes have different missions. You can look up their websites and find out there on which ones match your project best. So, to further explain this Byzantine system, here's the path your proposal takes at NIH. So, you send it in through the electronic Submission system is received at CSR, Center for Scientific Review, does all sort of initial processing. They're the ones who bang it back to you if they're, you've done your fonts wrong or whatever. They then send copies to, they send a copy to the institute to which you have been assigned and or institutes if you have more than one. You, you request the institute and a cover letter, typically. So the institute immediately starts overseeing and shepherding your application, and you will have a contact person there called your program officer or your PO. 
But they will basically, so they're basically there to just advise you and give you help up until the time your grant gets finished with review. Then another copy of your grant, or multiple, goes to the Center for Scientific Review, where it gets assigned to a study section, which is a group of your so-called peers, which are a mixture of academic and industry people, typically. Um, those people will read your grant and assign it a priority score, which is supposed to be based, supposed to, entirely on scientific merit. Those scores are then sent to, forward to the institute, where the program directors, together with the, the senior staff of the institute and the institute's advisory council, deliberate over the scores and decide which grants they'll actually pay. So it's, a, it's frequently confusing. People seem to think that the actual review is done inside the institute, but no, that's not right. CSR runs all the reviews, and the study sections um, review grants from multiple institutes. So the review is separated. There's supposed to be whatever Chinese wall between review and um, program. And then, and the review is done supposedly entirely on scientific merit. Of course, political considerations, you know, are always at play. And then the institute bases their decision not only on scientific merit, but also what their current um, priorities are in terms of research areas they want to stimulate, et cetera, and how much money they happen to have um, that year, et cetera. So how long does it take to go through this process? Uh, the SBIR STTR has three deadlines a year, September, January, and April 5th. Um, and then the review occurs really that fast. It's speeded up these days. That's good. Anyway, <laughs> then it goes to review. Then it goes to the council uh, where they decide whether they're actually going to fund it or not. And then uh, for September grant, the early start date would be April. So that's seven-ish ish months. Now, the unfortunate thing about the system is if you don't get funded the first time around, Usually, you don't get your, so after your review, you'll get your score and you get a summary statement with the reviewer's critiques in it. Most typically, you don't get that in time to rewrite your application for the next deadline. You can sometimes rush and try to do it, but frequently it's not a good idea to do that. So sometimes you end up having to skip a cycle before you can reapply, and then things get dragged out longer. The one, one thing that's nice that is that, um, if you go back to the slides, when, mm -hmm. if you get a really high score in the scientific American review, um, you can kind of gamble with a very high likelihood you're going to get the grade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and NH actually funds you. You can start building work nine mm -hmm. days before a thing, and then you get that reimbursed. Mm -hmm. So 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 there's also a little bit of flexibility in, in the positive direction. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I think I made this clear. I'll just say it again because uh, people are always confused. Oh, well, this also brings up your context. So, the Center for Scientific Review oversees the study sections, and most importantly, they assign your proposal to a specific reviewer, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And the person there who is your contact is the scientific reviewer officer. And then again, the institute makes the final grant decisions, and in contact with the institute is the program officer. So the program officer is basically your advocate. They're your, they can be your therapist. You can call them with questions about the application process after the review. You can call online about, you know, so and so kissed me. It wasn't great. Um, give them reasons why you should be funded, even though your grant didn't quite make the, the pay line, etc. Uh, so that's your program person. Program person gets to funding, whereas CSR is review um, and they hand out the technical score, and it's actually quite limited how much interaction you can have with them. Although less limited than people. So the two kinds of funding opportunities at NIH, which are um, there in one case, if you just want to pick the topic which is most of the time, you can apply to this Omnibus SBIR. There's the website, and it's just sort of a standard vanilla uh, mechanism, and all the institutes buy into it. There are also targeted funding announcements, um, which are focused on a particular topic area, and 
and you can look at this website to see what they are. They're usually sponsored by just one institute or a few partnering ones. Um, and sometimes people always think, oh, an RFA, your chances of getting funded are better than usual. That may or may not be true. Um, depending on how popular the topic is, your, your um, competition may actually be higher in a study section looking at an RFA. So I would, by all means, caution against trying to, too many people, times people try to like mold their application and their ideas to fit either what they think the institute wants or what an RFA says, and you know, that virtually always is a bad idea. So if you have not picked, so your, your first two issues is to be part of the you have to pick an institute to apply to and a study section to ask for. And choosing your institute <coughs> is based on their mission or in the case if they're in the RFA that does, you are a poster child I would come for, then uh, there will only be a couple of institutes attached to it. If you have uh, a couple of different institutes that are relevant to you, then it's a good idea to call the um, relevant program director, program officers at the institutes and talk to them about your proposal and your specific aims. Ask them to see if they're, uh, if they sound interested, ask them if they know of any special RFAs or anything coming up. Um, and then the other thing is the different institutes have different success rates. For SBIRs, here are the two 14 rate, 2014 rates for phase one applications. And you can see it varies from, oh my god, the nursing institute of 4.1%, that's pretty terrible, to if you can do anything about alternative <laughs> medicine, the National Center for Alternative uh, Therapy, and I don't know if the less there is, is doing really well at 38.9%. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the Acupuncture Institute. <laughs> I always think of it. Although, I, 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 if you have something like that, I would, I would highly encourage you to pursue that institute. Let's see, I'm on uh, 19 minutes. Um, so, Another way to choose your institute is to look, I was going to take you for a test drive through a little bit here, grown so you can do it. These two websites, there's a, the NIH reporter is actually part of the federal reporter, which includes not only NIH, but also NSF, I think all the federal granting agencies. You can go in there and you can plug in the keywords for your proposal topic and find out which Institutes fund work like that, lists of the grants they fund, who your competitors are, the abstracts, how much money they got, all kinds of um, things. And you can also figure out which um, program officers and study sections um, are relevant to your proposal. And I know test track. So then your next step is to call these people and talk to them. So a lot of people are very intimidated by NIH program directors. I used to be when I was a PI, but then I became one. And look how sweet and nice I am. You should never fear calling your NIH program director. Some of them are sort of like, you know, a little fussy or, you know, uh, high on power or whatever. But for the most part, they're nice, friendly, kind people who actually want to help you. And you, it's a good idea to send them a, um, a quick summary of your proposal idea and then ask for a teleconference to discuss it. These days, those guys are pretty bad at returning phone calls. Um, so you should follow up and pester them. But don't like be calling them three times a day. <laughs> and then when you talk to them, it's it's, a, it's really good to make personal contact with them because you can figure out so much from about someone from the program director's side. Talking to an applicant on the phone, I used to be able to tell whether, by the way this person talked, whether they were like a personable, reasonable person who sounded like they were sensible, who like actually had a chance of being part of a successful business, or if they were some, you know, 
crazy <laughs> Asperger's spectrum kind of person. So, and if the program director ends up liking you, um, you can start a relationship that can last for years. If you've ever got the list, Sebastian will tell you more about in uh, his talk. And then you can also ask at that point if you can request more money. Although always give, like, have a budget in mind and just don't be like, how much money can I give out? Tell them what you want and why. Okay, now here is like a really deep, dark secret, which is it's not really the program director who's the most powerful person in the NIH system. It's actually the scientific review officer. Having done a detail at the scientific review when I was at NIH, these are the people who pick which people, which of your peers are going to review your application. And they're knowledgeable of the field. They know a lot about the politics of the field. And based simply on what reviewers they assign to your application, they can pretty much assure you of, well, assuming, assuming your application is basically scientifically sound, they can, based on the reviewers they pick, push you toward you know, getting a second percentile versus making it likely that you'll get nerfed or not discussed or in the bottom 50% simply based on the reviewers they choose. So that's how political review is, unfortunately. Um, it has partly to do with you know which reviewers would actually be interested and excited in your topic, which ones are generally positive people versus picky grouches, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the review officers, and you know, of course they're not supposed to consciously be doing any of this, but of course, you know, it's very hard not to be influenced by what they know. So it's a good idea to try to make a good impression on your SRO as well. And just just show them a little um, show them a little respect. Usually people don't call the SROs. They're they're sort of considered I don't know, the non social people of NIH, but they are really nice, hard working people too. So Send them a copy of your specific games and ask them if they think their study section is appropriate. And it turns out they they can just be fountains of helpfulness and information. Okay, I'm at 23 minutes. Here's a typical study section. And I have study section and a bunch of people crammed inside a DC hotel room. They don't even serve them coffee or pastries anymore. Everybody's tired, jet lag, and pissed off. Uh, the junior ones are all nervous about giving their reviews because they're trying to impress their elders. The older ones are like all politicking. Here's your proposal <laughs> at the bottom of the typical reviewer's file. They typically are um, brought in to be primary reviewer on five, six applications. Um, they may be secondary or tertiary on another five or six. Uh, the study section in general have to go through this whole pile. Uh, so you have, imagine, you have to stand out from all the rest, you have to be exciting, you have to sound smart, um, you have to make it clear that your project really is feasible. Uh, the way things run there is typically with NIH funding lines the way they are now, reviewers get their pile, they go through their applications, they'll, they know the only like that their top one or two favorites are likely to get funded and so they'll put all their effort into going to bat at, for, at the study section for those two applications. So that's the picture you have to have in mind and you must pitch your proposal to that reviewer whose pile you're going to be in who could be your advocate and make it as easy as possible for them to advocate for you. So to do that, you have to identify like the study sections, figure out who the reviewers are, um, know the review criteria, because that's how the reviewers, they have to go through each one's significance, innovation, approach, blah, blah. So familiarize yourself, present them with little sound bites that they can read to the um, study section. In other words, give it to them on a silver platter. Although it's a fine line between some people say, oh, you should really split and read them. You should talk to them like they're sort of an intelligent, you know, college freshman. Um, and that's probably, you need to pitch some of your writing at that level. But don't think these are a bunch of idiots that are going to be reading your proposal. Because a lot of the people who don't necessarily know that much about your technology will also be ones who know everything about it and who will be scrutinizing your application with time to come. Here are some sites to 
are finding funding opportunities from other agencies, including private foundations. Um, that one, pivot.cos, is something that use, this UC system is signed up for, so you should be able to get access. And then our, um, <laughs> I'm really running late. Uh, you, you can read it. It's, it's really important to give yourself a lot of time. I would say ideally like at least three or four months so that you have time to think through all these things and just revise and revise again and get your friends to read your grant and help you revise. Okay, finally the course. So QB3 offers this uh, SBIR CTR workshop and uh, we, we, we hold your hands through everything down to uh, people bring their laptops and we take individual people through the electronic registrations in case they run into any hitches. It's four or five sessions. We go through all the mechanisms, the procedures, the, the politics, the policies, the rules, the budgets, all the damn forms that are enough to make you want to stick pins in your eyes. We give you writing tips and grades and chip tips and you can find the information there. And if you have any questions, that's fine. Email. So next. Um, SRO is the most powerful at NIH, remember that. <laughs> so let's start our panel. Let's have the panelists come on up to the front here. And this is a, an open dynamic panel. So of course panelists you can question each other. And uh, it's fine too to get the conversation going. And we'll have the audience solicit questions. Uh, before we have questions, though, I'd like the other two panelists to introduce themselves. I guess since Josh is right here, close with me, I'll have Josh go first. Sure. Tell a little bit about his story and his panelists today. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah so I'm, I'm Josh Molho. I was, uh, I'd say a little bit of my background, PhD in engineering from Stanford. Uh, I've got about 15 years of industry experience at some larger companies, some startups, uh, mostly in life science, well, all in life science uh, tools or diagnostics. Uh, most recently, I spun a company out of UC Berkeley called Separate Biosciences. Actually, it was from the department in this building, bioengineering. Uh, Co-founders were uh, Professor Amy Error and one of her recent grads, uh, Kelly Gardner, who was the CEO. Um, we uh, raised uh, private funding, about one half million of private funding, about 350,000 in SBIR money. Um, we were maximum six people. Uh, our first lab was actually in this building, so we finally actually had enough money to have a lab. There's a, there's a, Q3 also runs a network of incubators, uh, and there's a, there's a lab in the back here that's actually officially not UC, so you can actually have companies um, in that space. Uh, and about, um, so this was founded in 2013, and about a month ago we were acquired by uh, Protein Simple, uh, part of uh, Biotechni, so Biotechni is a pretty large public trade company. And we're just currently in the process of like, transferring all our operations to, to San Jose and integrating the team down there. Cool, thank you. Uh, hi there, I'm Sebastian, Sebastian Giwa. I, um, um, so I came to US to do business school and finished my PhD in economics. Uh, but then I got really interested in science. So I uh, helped co found uh, the Organ Preservation Alliance, which is this non profit organization that um, is kind of uh, catalyzing the world to control biological time. So basically, you know, take a heart or liver or kidney that right now in transplantation only is going to survive for hours. And that's why you know they're flying the helicopters and landing in the roof of the hospital and all of that. Um, and basically, let's stop that. And you can do that with you know, cryo preservation, you can do it with hibernation, the way that they buried us in the winter, and different technologies. Um, so that was my first kind of taste of the SPR mechanism, because when we were trying to get the government to fund that, um, we started to talk with some different program directors and had very high success with the Department of Defense. That we eventually, by connecting them to our different scientific advisors at you know, leading institutions, um, created first three targeted RFAs. 
course of two separate uh, grant programs that were first ever in this space, and then they did it again. And, and that kind of you know, catalyzed a lot of momentum. So I've kind of seen it from the inside, so to say, a little bit. And then uh, uh, the other thing is about a year ago, uh, I founded, uh, co-founded a company that's doing R&D work in the same space, so organ banking. Uh, and uh, while we haven't yet felt we need to go after any private sector funding, uh, in, in you know whatever it is, like seven to eight months now uh, of time frame, uh, we've got them five different uh, uh, government awards, which four are SBRs. Um, so I kind of, you know, uh, from not knowing anything about SBRs a little bit more than a year and a half ago, uh, I've done those two things. Thanks, so we'll start off questions. If anyone has any questions to go off at the beginning? Sure. Um, yeah, I want to know how these SKR agencies measure their own success. In other words, how many of their funded companies become successful? I mean, some of them may, may, take, may take five or ten years to become profitable, but they want to see the best results. So how do they decide what's I actually success? do not Uh, so, they, so I think one of the things that they've done in the last five to ten years is that there's a couple of criteria. So for instance, if you keep getting a lot of phase ones, mm -hmm. but then you're not good enough to get to phase two, they actually turn you off. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing, if you uh, get a lot of uh, phase twos, um, they start asking you to uh, report on, or do you have any sales, do you have any profitability? Uh, and if those metrics are too bad, they also turn off for a while. Um, so, so at least they're looking at what the commercialization is, and there's some mechanisms to kind of you know, filter that out. But, but more than that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of, there are a lot of companies that are already independently operating companies that can get SBIRs. The small business is the company with less than 500 people. So um, oftentimes, uh, an established company will use an SBIR to do a side project. So it's like these mechanisms be tracked. I don't know how they track those other types of, of uh, projects because those companies are they are to be profitable, uh, but they may be using the SBR to fund and create some product line they wouldn't otherwise do because they don't have the resources. You can actually, especially the phase two, you, can, you have enough to sort of build up a small team to focus on. The and then um, I also did look that up a little bit online. So I think with the DoD, they will follow you see if your company exits, uh, gets acquired, and they'll list that in their numbers. They take a very proud claim that the DOD is the number one SBR funders in terms of success. Mm. Something like over 50%. So so they follow you. They put like a person who follows yeah. you around. You have to file a thing every year with them to say how your company's going, even if you got an SBR award five years ago. You know, mm. and you, you know, just keep filing. They follow you. They, they're sure. custom advisors. Right? So yeah, I, don't, they, they, I investigate they, myself and pump. I'm, I'm successful. <laughs> but thanks for the answer. Anybody else? Yeah, back. So, <clears throat> do they care about the origin of the intellectual property? For example, if it's from a foreign country, this is an important aspect. Ooh. Foreign country is tough, I don't know the answer to that. I, IP is not my forte either. Um, it, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe one way of explaining is that, so in the phase one, uh, you, you have to really articulate that this is huge need and there's going to be like a market, but they won't necessarily look that much at those things. When you then apply for the phase two, and you can actually do this at the same time, by the way, so if you have like the whole master plan, you can apply for phase two oh. at the same time. Uh, if you either do that, it's called a fast track, or you apply for phase two, uh, in addition to the, the research strategy, which is like, you know, where you have the experimental design and you're talking about the technology, you also have to have a commercialization strategy. Uh, in the commercialization strategy, you need to address how you really are going to capture the value, how you're going to be creating jobs, sure. uh, and and in there you talk about the IP. So my guess would be if you, if someone else invented the thing and you're going to like develop it, but you have like a, an agreement so right. that you have access to it, licensing or something, yes. you're probably fine. Um, if it's if if you can't show that, it's going to be a big weakness. That okay, you prove it, and then someone else goes and commercializes. Yeah. I'd say you probably run into trouble if they can figure out in phase one that you don't have access to something. A reviewer will come pick up on that if there's some obvious. But assuming you did have licensing rights, 
Okay. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the forum was something worth looking at. I don't know, there are some Byzantine rules that is it, related to, to sort of US versus, I would guess it's probably okay. But yeah, the, the main things in the forum that I've seen, there might be more, so, so ask the program, right? But right. Uh, is that you're doing the work on US soil okay. and with uh, green card holders. You can actually use visa holders also, but for the DOD, they're more, it has to be a green card holder sure. or a uh, US citizen. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. My second question um, about yeah, the commercialization. So I assume they, they want to see that you thought about how to bring this thing to the market. And in my case, I could probably pick between a very capital intense way where I produce a lot of things myself and need a lot of follow up funding after SKR, or a licensing model where I think the customer would pay for it and I'll, I'll get royalties. Is there any preference um, that S S SKR prefer? One or the other? I'm going to leave this to the business guys yeah, too. So, and so, uh, so, so, I'll first on you guys. Yeah. Um, so, I, I don't think so. I, so, technically, you know, I talked to some friends who sit on the SDR panels. Technically, you're not, they're, they're not even really, the, they're the scientific review guys aren't even really supposed to, to pay much attention to that. They do read through it. Um, it needs to hold together. I can't have huge holes. So, we have some cons on our phase two. Don't think so, but you need to have a strategy that pulls together. Mm. Uh, that, would be, that would be my opinion for my limited number of apps to. Have you done phase, have you done phase two yet? Uh, no. Yeah. I've applied for the first one, but I don't have that yet. I have one. We applied for one, and it, we actually have an intent to, to fund. We never got to. I don't think we're going to take it now. <laughs> no longer a small company, but uh, we'll see. But uh, yeah, that that's my experience. I don't think it matters, but it needs to be well. It needs to hold together. Hmm. Don't have obvious goals in it. Yeah, and uh, our thing is in the in the first like the big thing, right? We're gonna try to do this Apollo program type of thing, control like stop the time of an organ. Uh, so that fits in the other one, and we've been successful getting it. Uh, so at least the whole spectrum is open. But if there's a preference, if we could have like tweaked it, so there was like this middle step, maybe they would like that more. Hmm. Yeah, you, you should make, so our phase two application had letters from investors, it had letters from potential um, commercial partners, hmm. and so you want to have, so if you say you're doing licensing, it's best if you have somebody who's expressing like, they're not saying, hey, I'm going to license, they're saying, I you sure would be interested in this, and it's compelling. If, if you, if your idea requires 20 million in funding, find some investor that at least will say, like, in a letter, it's not going to make anything, hmm. I really like this area, if it, you know, developed past ABCDI with definition investing. Yeah. So may maybe uh, if I can jump in there, it's one of the things I was thinking about this I was driving here in the car is, um, so most of you are postdocs, right? So you're, you've probably been involved in like the, the typical grant, right? like the academic R, R1 or like those types of grants. Um, the thing that, um, and, and you started to list them before, they, there's kind of these five criteria, right? So there's significance, there's uh, innovation, there's the, the research approach. Uh, Investigator and learn. Yeah, yeah. So then, and then there's the, the basically the people of the team, uh, and and then your environment. Um, and I think one thing, you know, as a scientist, that you're always thinking about how cool your technology is and how you're going to design the optimal experiments and all that. Um, and and without that, you don't have a chance. So like, you have to have that top notch. But to really like have a kind of a step up against the competition you can do a lot in those other areas. So like on the significance, like if you can map out, you know, how this really is gonna be game changing for the world and like do a little bit of market research and show how many lives it's gonna save or how many jobs it's gonna create and stuff like that, that gives you a little bit of an edge. Mm -hmm. um, and also on, on the people. So depending on um, who's in your, your team, you might be commercializing some technology from a professor that's really heavy and all of that. But if you don't have that, consider pulling in a subcontractor, maybe even just giving them 10% of the grant, or they might not agree to that. But if you give them like 25%, they, they, they might, you might find someone that's powerful, and now you're coming in as that duo, and it just looks so much stronger. Uh, the same with like the levels of support. Uh, like Spending a lot of time really thinking about what are the weaknesses we have, if it is it that I have to address that, it's gonna be the investor, the licensing, 
is it that this, they might critique that, hey, is this aspect of the technology really have a chance? If you have a world leader saying, hey, I support this, I'll be a consultant, call me. Uh, so like those types of things, um, once you have a strong research strategy, that's maybe where you sometimes can kind of make the difference between really getting funded in it. Yeah, I would um, back that up and say the companies I've worked with, m most frequently their, their weak spot is their team. So in one example, I worked with uh, a couple guys, one who had come from a big IT background, another who had been a pioneer in the area of virtual reality. The IT guy, I just retired from a big company and he was, he'd always been interested in psychology and he was like, wouldn't it be cool to have like an online therapy program? You know, and if you had virtual reality, oh wow, that's even cooler. You have like a virtual therapist that you can, um, and they were gonna set up these little behavioral programs for anxiety and addiction, blah, blah, blah. So this is like a super good, cool idea. The only problem was neither of these guys had any background in actual psychology <laughs> and so that they did was pull in you know expert outside consultants but but those people you know really all they did was write a letter saying yes so if you need my help it's good so if if you want to really have committed um, strength in every area that's critical in your project so if it's a clinical thing you want your clinical expertise to really be committed, invested, um, and show that they are, and hopefully be paying them some money so that they actually really are. You see where I'm going with that. Don't overlook the environment piece, which is if your plan says that you're going to do a whole bunch of high resolution fluorescent microscopy, you better make it clear how you have access to that thing. Mm -hmm. Don't say anything like that, your whole proposal will be a tank by a reviewer saying, I don't believe they have access right. to equipment. And it might be like, oh, I just forgot to say that. Mm -hmm. right? but I have this lab, I have access to it, I rent it for whatever. But you have to say all that stuff. You gotta go through everything you're saying you're gonna do, how am I gonna do it? How have I said, you know, how, how I'm gonna access that equipment? Have I said how I'm gonna have this consultant who can tell me this one little piece that maybe on my background is going to do it. Yeah, um, is there any uh, criteria like market size that you can address? This kind of consideration or is this is just uh, I, I don't I've never seen any minimum things. Um, and a little bit of the proof there is that if you start, especially when it's a startup, right? Mm -hmm. Um they're gonna believe that you like it's not you wouldn't be doing it if you don't think there's a market. Um, but whatever your market size is though, you really want to show them that you understand it. Right, so, so that, that's where I'm saying that, you know, talking about the need for whether it's customers, hospitals, whatever, like the, the ecosystem is, and, and showing, ideally showing that, the, that, that it's growing, uh, and then how big it is. But I haven't, I haven't seen any criteria that anything would be too small. But, but, but of course, the more convincing you can make that it is large, the better. So, so. For example, if there's an impact, like a, a very small a disease with very small patients, it's not detrimental that the patient is any person. Well, is there a way you can you can show how it might be generalizable to other? Uh, yeah, but that's the right. That's the theory. For me? That's a theoretical question. In the case where you really your target population is really small. Is that a factor or not? I mean, I think if you can say that nobody else is addressing that, that's probably fine. I mean, if you have a huge market and you have a great way of doing something, that maybe there's other ways of doing it, but you have a here and the approach has the advantages, that probably works. If you've got like a small market, a defined disease, and no one else is serving it, it seems like that would be a criteria. You also got to take off when you, these are all, like, again, like these are like part phase two. You're probably not going to Everybody has a five-year plan, 
five-year plan doesn't have, you know, at least in my area, at least like sixty million dollar revenue. They, they're just like, they don't. You're not reaching high enough. They know that they're like, yeah, you're not going to get that. But if you don't at least like make a compelling plan, like here's how if everything goes well, I'm going to make a hundred million dollars in year five, then they're like, huh, this person, really, you know, they don't even believe themselves, right? So they're immediately discounting that anyway. It's not the same with these applications, but you have to take it off a little bit. Just be bold, basically. What's the best, if it's theoretical or best case scenario, say, hey, I can solve this one problem now, and, and what would be really exciting is this technology could apply here, and I guess. Yeah. So, you're guys going to be talking a lot about the importance of understanding the market. Does the team have to have someone on it who is an expert at the market or at business, or should it just be the technical? I'd say the sooner you get some market savvy consult, you don't you don't have to have them as a. Um, so for phase one, it's not a big issue, but just for your own sake of your own future, I'd say the sooner you get business expertise on board, the better. We um, um, in the beginning, our first couple of rounds, we didn't really mention that that much at all. Uh, and then we did a, a, a project, we applied for a project that we did get funded together with the lab at Harvard. And that professor was saying, hey, said you have a great bio, why, why, why are we not selling you as part of the application? Um, so now when we do the SPRs, we include me. Um, I haven't seen anything in the comments yet, whether that's helped or not, but the professor had seen in similar situations before that it had helped. Uh, so now we're also sometimes, you know, throwing in, uh, we have a, a board member who's uh, CEO of the stock listed company, so we throw a sentence in into the grant, so that is his name. How much is helping, I don't know. But I think going in that direction is probably good. We've got data on review, I think, for not having, in fact, we had staff. But then if it's a business grant, you're trying to, the ambition is to make money. And you, even as a CEO, even if you're a scientist, you should be able to do some market research uh, to, to know like what you said. You got to know how big your market is. Is it even worth going after that? And on campus, there are some resources. Uh, they're called MBA fellows. Uh, you can actually talk to them, and they can actually do some work for you guys. Uh, there could be a co-founder if you need to. Uh, but you know, there, there are, they're looking for a scientist to find a business case. Mm -hmm. So you should definitely reach out to MBA fellows on campus. Uh, so one, one, uh, sorry, go ahead. Just on the opposite side of this gentleman's question, what if your technology is more like a material and you see, you know, the, the application is very general and you have lots of markets that you see applying, you know, how, I guess, it's like, is that a danger to list too many markets in your in your application? I, I think if you randomly do it, it could be a problem. But I think right. you have a great, that, that's probably a dream case. Because you can kind of focus in on, here's you know our battle plan for the first market. And then after that, we're going to go after this and this and this. Okay. And if it sounds like that, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, so that, that's the question. Or even better than that. Right, for each different <laughs> or two different funding agencies, and just yeah, focus in on different applications. The people can be, you can be, you can get your success rate. You know. Right. So, so on that point, when we put up our hand at the same time, that was actually the, I was going to get into that reflection. So there's a there's a there's a learning curve here, and there's also scale effects from the perspective of you know you have to create your bio sketch in a certain way if you're doing for the DoD versus if you're doing for NIH. So there's a lot of things that you, you, you do, you spend the cost once, and then you can leverage that across many grants. 
So, so to some extent, I think you should be thinking about this as if you're going to spend the effort of trying to go after some grants within an agency, uh, are there creative ways where you can, like, what was it, 22 different institutes at NIH? 27. 27. Yeah. Um, can you think about creative ways where you can take your technology and you can slice it up into several different powerful grant programs? Because especially if you're even submitting them in the same cycle, you can get the same letters of reference like you have a person for three letters, but it's not harder really for them to sign three times than to give, give you one. Um, you, you know all of the form systems and all of that stuff. Um, and, and, and for us it's been surprising sometimes. You know, we've had like two to three submissions the last couple of cycles. And uh, in two of them, uh, the one of the three that we thought was the worst grant was the one that got funded, and then the best one didn't get funded. So, so there's a lot of randomness also. So it's, it's, if you have the energy to do it, you know, writing that extra grant once you've done the first one might only be 40% more work, not 100% more work. I totally agree, yeah. If you can develop a template that you can yeah. <laughs> modify, definitely the first one. Get it, once you get the, just getting the registrations done is unbelievably pain in the neck, and just getting that finished gets the whole world wrong. So there's definitely a true of that, um, in the same case. We worked really, really hard for about uh, four weeks on one application, and we crammed out something else in less than a week, and that one got funded. And we're still <laughs> waiting here about the four-week one. Like, hmm, it was pretty good. This other one, I didn't even know what was going on, but we got money. <laughs> so that can happen. <laughs> so I have a question. From I have a question, yeah. Um, what is the exit process? Let's say you've got a grant. What then? Right? You have your this form or the word business end rather than the science end, but let's say you submit your business case, get approved by your viewers, so get funded, and then you work hard and lock it out, kick off, make it happen, and what? Is what is yeah. the end? So I guess that's more you because you've done it. I'm I'm dreaming of doing it, so I'll give you my I can give you my perspective on what I'm trying to do though. Well it depends what it depends what your goal is. Try to build a company that's going to grow. 
grow and grow and grow. Uh, we were on a path where we were at the, the next round was going to be you need to raise, you know, five to twenty million dollars with private investment. And we happened to get a larger company interested in us. They know what don't do that. We're just going to buy you now. Um, but that's a different ball game. And the grants will only take once you take that private money. Typically, the timeline for the grants is too slow. The investors will expect you, they expect progress at a rate fast. So you can keep applying for them, and they could, but we couldn't have done it without SBR money uh, for a number of reasons. It was, as you said, it, it was uh, external validation, so it helped us the investors. Um, it, there was a time when our phase one came in, we were negotiating with investors, and we had one a group of investors that were like trying to put the screws to us, and we're like, you know what, Like we just got 350K, we don't need like, oh, no, 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 so that, that was, um, <laughs> uh, and literally we would have run out of money if we hadn't had it because we ended up using almost all the money that we raised before we got acquired. So it can definitely be helpful if you're going to go that route, you're going you're gonna to have to get private money, is my opinion, and what I can figure out talking to people. But it really depends on what you want to do. But the number one question you got to ask, what am I trying to get out of this? What do I want to do? I think that the way he did it is the way I want to do it. So, <laughs> but it's only one way. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't, uh, don't let anyone tell you that any one way is like better than the other. Uh, just depends what you want to get out of it. We have time for a couple more questions, and then after that, we'll go outside and we can have some beer for those of us who want to hang around and talk and network. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, slicing your technology and buying multiple brands. So that's it. Navigate issues regarding conflicts of interest as you're doing that. I mean, even though it's all the same business, but you're making different pitches. Is that a bit so, so you you can't take um, government funding from any of the government agencies to do the same thing. Right. So that's the thing you have to manage. Um, in our case, I'll give you a very concrete example of how it works quite well. So you know we're focusing a lot on liver banking, so basically they have to bank livers. Um, but we're also interested in a couple of other systems, uh, including banking hands for the military, uh, the kidney, and a little bit the heart, but we're doing less on that. Um, there, if we have roughly the same technological approach, with the cryotectants and like what type of cooling protocol and all these things, um, we can switch out the cell systems and then the organ system. Uh, and. Uh, with a few tweaks, we're in the zone of that these are two different research projects. Um, another thing you can do uh, is if you know that your, your full research program is going to take you, you know, maybe it's going to take you three million and not one and a half million, you can just break it down into two sub projects, right? So, so for instance, one of the things that we're doing is we have the pressure, we're using pressure as one of the, uh, the ways of achieving the preservation. That's like one type of grant. And then on the other side, we have the cryotectants, which are the, the chemical compounds that we're using. And eventually, we're going to be putting them together, but we're developing them as two different programs. Yeah, so you're dividing it to research project and so much. This is the business, this is the, but the point where I guess the conflict of interest might still be an issue is when the long term is you no. see them coming. So, so where, when you say conflict of interest, what do you mean? Well, it, like you said, you can't apply uh, to multiple government agencies. You can apply to many government well, agencies and have many government grants. You can just not take two dollars to do one dollar of work. Right. Okay. It's all still one business. Yes. It's not like you're pitching. You're you're proposing two two separate businesses, and it may be like in the, you know, if if there were, uh, if they were separate businesses, even though one's like you know working on pressure, and one's working on prior preservation. That might be competitive, but generally in my understanding on this, the government doesn't care so much about that. They just they want to know mm -hmm. is it a defined project that's not overlap. Yeah. So they said that there's and, some and people get busted for that. Like yeah. pe people sometimes submit roughly the same grant, take the money from both, and then they have, you know, they'll have work on the project and then they give results to both. Mm -hmm. That's criminal and illegal and all of that stuff. You'd never want to do that. Right. NIH has um, has gotten super picky about Submitting, it used to be you could submit the same proposal, sort of slightly tweaked to two different institutes, or you could submit to NIH and NSF the same thing. NIH now is very fussy about it. They don't want um, uh, 
a, a particular set of specific games, as they call it. it. It's only supposed to be coming in once. But um, yes, you can modify it for you know, a slightly different disease application or whatever. And yes, the bottom line is they don't want you double dipping. That's really. I mean, to be clear, I understand what Seth was describing. Describing would be absolutely no problem at all. Uh, I don't know if people would agree. It's two very separate research projects. Oh, they're and separate research. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even though you would, you would logically say, hey, that 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 sounds like one company that they're going to be a leader in this space. That doesn't matter. You just can't say, hey, I'm using pressure. And you go, to the, hey, I'm using pressure. Yeah. <laughs> but you, but but well, to nuance it, to nuance it a yeah. bit. Uh, you can say we're going to use pressure at 50 megapascal on liver cells, and then you can say, and here is another thing where we're going to use 200 megapascal on heart cells, right? And even if to some extent maybe it's the same device, uh, but roughly the things I just said would be different enough to be two different research projects. Yeah, so it's, you can just define it two research projects, two separate research projects. Yeah, but it, it literally needs to be that this experiment could not just substitute the other one and then you're done. Yeah. But if, if it literally is two different things you're working on. And you can't pay yourself 200%. You can't, you can't like, <laughs> put your salary on. Like, say I'm getting paid for it. You, you actually need to work. You say I'm working 20% time a year. Right. Right, you get it. But then you apply it twice. Right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. the thing I just said would be applied twice. Uh, well, I know people who apply like 90 times. If you're starting a company, that's the main thing to think about. And how long before you're going to start getting the private sector funding? Because if it's long, you might not want to have it directly. But if you know you're going to invest in quite soon, you definitely want to start with C-Corp. Um, an LLC is, like, if you start starting a box, it's not going to cost you anything anyway. Mm -hmm. The reason to have an LLC is if you're thinking about having an operating business, you're going to be profitable. LLC might be more tax advantage for you. Mm -hmm. C-Corp basically, not so great. Okay, well, let's thank the panelists for the